I'm going to jump into God's Word this morning because, as I mentioned, my, uh, my daughter-in-law and our family, we've been dealing with a lot of uh, sickness, illness in our body, and I don't want to make it any more difficult on her to be able to sing. Last week, she had to lean on Sister Kim to help her pull her through uh, because it's been rough. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night because I coughed and hacked a lot. My throat still feels tight, but we're going to praise the Lord anyhow. I feel like God's given me a word today that um, it's a message that if if I had the ability, I'd love to preach it in a great coliseum somewhere. Anybody remember the days of Billy Graham whenever you would see like giant coliseums and thousands upon thousands of people would be gathered together and and he would preach to so many people. I, to be truthful, if it were the Lord's will and God had given me that opportunity, I'd love to preach this message in a Colosseum setting to the church, to the church. And I uh, believe by the time that I'm done, you'll understand the reason why. How many of you believe this morning that we could use a whole lot more compassion and mercy for other people in the church? Um, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I can tell you that I've just been in the mindset here lately, the Lord's been dealing with my heart, that I just feel similar to the way that God revealed himself in other passages of, of the Word of God like he did with Laodicea. I just feel like that God is sick, sick of hypocrisy. And, um, and that's one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning. But that's not the only thing that I want to talk to you about. I just I want to obey God, and I feel like he's going to help us. Can you say praise the Lord for the word? Amen. And uh, so it might be a little uncomfortable at times. It might be tight, or you might even just jump up and down and run the backs of the chairs. I don't know. But one thing's for sure, with God's help, I plan to obey him. He's given me something, and I, I intend to share it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, if you have it, you can... Get a hold of it, your phone, your iPad, your, your Bible, unzip your Bible case, turn there, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, beginning. I'd like to take my time to unpack this because there are some things that I think we need to really take consideration to. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse number 12, again, if you are watching or listening online, thank you. Thank you so much. We surely appreciate your faithfulness to support and uh, be a part of what God's doing here in little Lola Popka and Gray Street. The Bible says here in Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It cuts deep. And of the joints and marrow. Pay attention to this line. And as a discerner, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is the unseen and unheard part of our life that other people may not know anything about, but God says, I do. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now pay very close attention here. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All things are naked. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed from the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let's have one more word of prayer this morning. Father, we, we are so thankful for your word. For the next few moments, God, we're praying for that anointing that keeps us humble, that anointing that convicts us, that anointing, God, that reveals you through the word of God. I am praying today that your perfect will is completely accomplished. There will be people that will not hear or take heed to this message. But for those who will, let this message find them and let them listen. Let them take heed and let them apply it. I pray you'll help me to apply it in my life as well. And we'll praise you for what you do, and everyone can say amen. So with the Lord's help today, I'm going to preach on naked before God. I don't mean to be funny, but I don't think there's too many people that would want to be naked this morning. I'm going to be honest with you. I, whole, I look a whole lot better with clothes on than I do without. In case you're wondering... I do. Hopefully you weren't. But I want to take a look back at verse number 13 for just a minute. I want you to see what the Bible says here. It says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Whose sight? God's. But he says, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He is saying to you and me that when it comes to God, all things are naked. All things are open to the eyes of God. There is nothing that he cannot or does not see about you. If you really stop and think about that in the depths of that, that's kind of a that's a scary thought, to think that God knows every single thought that runs through your mind, to know that God knows every aspect of how you feel. He knows all of your actions, your deeds, and your lack thereof. Do you know this morning to be naked is to be completely exposed? When I think about being completely exposed, I think about how that sometimes grandma will have a cross with Jesus hanging on it in the house, symbolic of the crucifixion of Christ, which is whereby our redemption came. I am thankful he's no longer on the cross, aren't you? But for purposes of dignity, people often will have a picture or a emblem of Christ on a cross and he'll have some sort of garment wrapped around him for the purpose of dignity. I mean, it wouldn't look too dignified to have a naked Jesus hanging on the wall. But how many of you realize that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was fully exposed? He was fully in full, complete humiliation. There was nothing that was hid or concealed. Can someone with me agree that that would be an embarrassing thing before the, all the eyes of everybody? That is to be completely exposed. There's no, no part of you that is hidden. You're not like Adam and Eve who, when they realized their nakedness, they went and hid, they took fig leaves and sewed them together and they hid themselves from God not realizing that even though they had sown fig leaves together, that God could see straight through those fig leaves. He could see straight through the brush or the bushes where they are. 
even though that God comes to the garden and he says, where art thou, Adam? It was not because God did not know the location, the, the exact GPS marker where that Adam and Eve were at. It wasn't because of that. It was because God wanted to bring attention to the fact that uh, to Adam, so that Adam realized that God knew that he was hiding from him. You see, this morning there is uh, a, another aspect of, of looking at being naked. It is, it is that nothing is covered and nothing is hidden and everything is revealed and everything is seen. Can you imagine your life laid out in such a way that there is no part, not one year, not a month, not a season, but every single part of your entire life is laid out, and God knows every single part. It's all exposed. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is secret. Nothing is private. God knows all of those moments late night moments, early morning moments, moments by yourself, moments in a crowd or moments, whoever or wherever. Somebody say, that's a scary thought this morning. There's really no need for us to try and hide anything from God or to pretend like that somehow that God does not know. To, to take on the, the idea that somehow if I do it or conceal it in such a way that mama doesn't know or daddy doesn't know, my husband doesn't know, my wife doesn't know, but that somehow that God does not know. But I just came to tell you that God is telling you this morning that even that that you think you have so well concealed that God knows. It came back to my mind this morning and sometimes like Brother Eric said, even though I know the word of God, my memory sometimes will fail me, but I believe it was Saul in the Old Testament who had tried to conceal his identity by putting on a mask and trying to appear as though he was something else. And you know, even when he did that, God knew who was behind the mask. And I want you to know this morning that if you put on a mask, a facade of Christianity, or facade of maybe what you pretend to be. Do you know that God understands and sees whatever is behind the mask that we put on? Say amen. So I want us to realize that the whole of our text today, it deals with the inner man and the inner man's struggles. I don't have the time that I wish I did to break it all down, but I want to try to show you just by looking back at the text how that it shows that this inner man has inner struggles and God understands that he does. Well, if you look at verse 12 with the word of God and its ability to know and experience Expose whatever it is that is going on in your life. He says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Bible said that it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is a revealer of what's really going on in your life. You can sit there and hold your wife's hand and smile and say amen to the preacher. But when the word of God is preached in its purest form, the conviction that carries through like saturated dew, amen, on a leaf in the early morning hours of the day. God brings conviction along with the word of God because it has a way of revealing things about where you really stand with God. You might want to think that you're closer to God than you really are, but God's word says, I will show you exactly where that you stand with God. Say amen, somebody. Oh, but even and if nobody else knows, somebody say, he knows. Somebody say, he knows. I want us to realize that the whole of our text, it deals with that inner man and his struggles. And that verse 12 shows the word of God and its ability to know and expose. Then to show our true motives and the thoughts that no one else can hear that run through our mind. Oh, I may get ahead of myself, but I want to tell you that the more I begin to think about that, that is probably more dangerous than a lot of the pet peeve sins of 
that people like to talk about. Maybe they might say, well, I know he's smoking Marlboro. Or I know that he smells like marijuana. Or I know that he's come in smelling like alcohol. And you may be able to know that on the surface, but it is that hidden stuff that nobody doesn't know about that you're able to conceal that is often the most dangerous of all sins. Can someone say amen? Those, those concealed things, those hidden things, those things swept up underneath the rug, the things that you like to not, uh, you don't like to talk about. And then we see in verse 13, it lets us know that there is nothing that is not exposed that God does not see. He lets us know that there's not a creature on the face of the earth that is not naked. There's not a man, there's not a woman, there's not a boy or a girl that every act and every deed and every part of their life is not naked and exposed before the eyes and open for God to see. Then we move down and look at verse number 15. It speaks of the temptations that we contend with inwardly. If you look at me in the whites of my eyes and tell me that you never have temptation, I will look you back in the whites of your eyes and tell you you are a liar because everybody daily is tempted with something. That does not mean that you give in to the temptation. That does not mean that you yield to the temptation. Some folks are thinking, well, I don't, I'm not tempted to drink. I'm not tempted to smoke. Uh, but you're tempted to lie. You're tempted to cheat. You're tempted to steal. You're tem- tempted to lust. You're tempted to pride. You're tempted to jealousy. Tempted to gossip. Tempted. Come on, somebody. We're in the holiday season. Tempted to be gluttonous. Come on, tempted to be. Come on, somebody, and help me preach a little while. I'm just telling you that the Bible tells us these temptations are going on on the inside of the human being. But thankfully, verse 16 reminds you and me that even though God knows that the word, it reveals the thoughts and intents, and even though we have temptations, and even though we have inward struggles, verse 16 reminds us that a trip to the altar in the presence of God, there we can find the needed strength and mercy for our inner struggles. Anybody else see that? You see, I'm not sure this morning that we really take the time to consider just how naked that we are before God. This morning, if you're one of those that when the preachers preach it, you often think, well, I hope Sister Sally's getting this because she sure needs it. I pray this morning that you quit worrying about Brother Roger and ain't so-and-so and Uncle whoever and your neighbor down the pew aisle number four and you start looking at me right here, me, myself, and I. Lord, look at me. I hope you'll do that this morning, but I'm not sure that we take the time to consider just how naked that we are, that I am, that you are before God because there is no secret that is unkept. Do you know that you can live your whole entire life and die dead three o'clock, dead as three o'clock in the morning and carry your secret all the way to the grave and nobody know anything about your secret or your private sin. But you know something? They may not know, but I said God knows there is no private life there's no double life that God's not aware of there is nothing that can be deleted come on no text message no phone call no internet history no disappearing snapchat that he don't know about if you're guilty of something he knows every detail and aspect of that somebody say God help me you see even though those private thoughts play out in your mind. You know that the ones that may never get spoken out loud, you have the ability to keep them to yourself. 
And so some people will posture themselves and they seem religious and pious. And while they've got their little stuff under the rug or under the wraps and they never talk about that, they step up on a soapbox and point their finger at everybody else while yet there's some baggage behind that God knows all about that they have yet to talk about to anybody else. Come on and say amen to that. Those are the private thoughts that if them private thoughts that you go through your mind sometimes, if they played like a scene from a movie for everybody to watch, we would probably be embarrassed of the people that were watching and how that they might question our character if they knew everything that went through your mind during the day. Come on now, that ain't popular, but that's real, 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 real. You may not like it, but somebody say that's the real thing. You see, I feel like uh, that God has commissioned me to preach today uh, on two different aspects of this exposed naked reality. The first one uh, of just how hypocritically savage that we can be with the sins and failures of other people. Did you hear that? I feel like God's brought me here for two reasons. Uh, The first is to show you just how hypocritically savage uh, that you and I can sometimes be with the sins and failures of other people while we yet overlook ours. Say man. And secondly, to show you just how merciful that God must be to know so much about me and to know so much about you and yet he still loves us and invites us to the supper table of eternity in heaven. Somebody say thank God for that. But first, let me take a few moments in light of just how naked that you are and I am before God and address this thing called hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, my hypocrisy, your hypocrisy, our hypocrisy, say man. The longer that I have lived, I have been afforded to work with a lot of God's people. I have had the opportunity to work with people in ministry in so many different capacities. It is a privilege, I believe, but it has shown me another side of the church, another side of God's people that sometimes we don't like to talk about. But now more than ever in my time of ministry after all of these years, I realize now more than ever why that we need a Savior and why that we need a plan of redemption. Do you know that one of the fallen character natures of humanity is hypocrisy? It is part of the fallen nature. It is us looking across the way, pointing our finger at somebody else about everything they do and yet not sweeping off our own porch. Say, man, it's us talking about how bad everybody else is. I don't know, does that make us feel better about who we are? It's like the people on social media who will go on blast and put everybody in their place but their self. Amen, what they're doing, and you don't realize this, uh, there's pride behind that spirit. Uh, the pride beats its chest like a gorilla out in the, in the jungles. Uh, like, look at me. Uh, we're still holding tight. Uh, we're still doing right. Uh, look at us, but everybody, we're not like uh, everybody else. Uh, you may not realize that, but you sound just like uh, the people, the two men that were praying uh, in the temple and one said, God, uh, I thank you that I'm not like him. Uh, I'm holier than him you know do you know that God is not pleased with that and that is a stench in the nostrils of God say man somebody I mean come on now we sin and act as though it's no big deal but now when our neighbor falls short I wish I'd have had the time I wanted this morning I do. I, if I'd have been preaching in a camp meeting or that big coliseum I was talking about, I'd have found somehow another to do it. I would. I'd have went by Walmart and I would have went down to the fabric section and I'd have had me a giant yardstick this morning. I would have, because you know what we do.
I mean, when we sin, it's, oh, God, hope nobody finds out. Oh, forgive me, God. But you ever meet anybody that on the flip side of that, they're going to break out their yardstick and go measuring everybody, going comparing everybody. Did you see what she did? Did you see what he said? Did you hear what they posted? Did you hear what was going on over their house? Did you hear about their marriage? Did you hear he's lost another job? Did you hear, did you hear, did you hear? I pray to God. God, that the next time the spirit of did you hear comes across your lips that you, that you ask yourself oh they might want to hear a few things about you too but how about we just take it to God we're the same kind of people that will gossip about our cousin's daughter getting pregnant yeah I heard she got pregnant you hear how old she ain't but 16 yeah she ain't married neither. But we don't want to tell nobody that we was having sex before marriage long before we ever got married. You say, Pastor, that don't make it right. I didn't say it did. But you better find some more compassion down in your reservoir. Because I hear where the Bible said such were some of you. So what do you suppose I do about it? Well, it ain't your place to go around like some kind of Holy Ghost policeman giving everybody tickets. What it is your job is pray that God will have mercy because lest you find out that it comes to your house. Through my time of ministry, it has never ceased to amaze me. The preachers that got up and preached against uh, being married more than once, uh, some called double marriage, uh, and then years later come to find out their own children go through it. You know why? Because it has a way of coming full circle, baby. Let me tell you, if you can live it, live it. Stand by it. But let me tell you somebody, you better make sure that you ain't got a closet full of skeletons before you go picking apart somebody else's bone shed. Say amen. Amen. But we conveniently leave that part out, you know. We don't want to talk about that part because that, you know, that will, that will shine a, a, a negative light on us. We don't want people to think bad of us. I'm talking about the kind of people that critique someone's attendance record, but their tithe record ain't much better. Now, that might get a little bit tight, but praise God anyhow. And I don't mean that in no negative spirit. I'm just telling you the truth is the truth. Well, you know, I... You, did you see he ain't been here but four Sundays in the last two months yeah and every time he comes he pays his tithes you've been here every Sunday what about you now you might have a perfect attendance record but your tithe record that's something else somebody say I smell hide smoking that, that come on <laughs> amen I, I met now this is going to hit home for some of you and, uh, but that's all right. If the shoe fits it, put it on, Cinderella. Hey, man, we've, I've met people that'll get fighting mad if they find out there's an immigrant caravan headed for the border of the United States. Uh, hey, man, but the same people don't think twice about getting out on the interstate going 80 miles an hour, breaking the law, going like, come on, instead of doing 65. Hey, man, breaking the laws, breaking the law, baby, one way or the other. It hey, meant your personal preference. You need to, you need to kind of calm it down, tone it down a little bit because some of you are beginning to sound like a bunch of Laodicean hypocrites say man either be hot or cold find out where you are who are you trying to please anyway well the folks we run with they believe like this baby you better get back to the word of God because there's areas of your life that are rotten and stinking and full of dead men's bones even though you got the outside of the sepulcher bleached out white looked like 409 came by and did a baptismal but I'm going to tell somebody you got problems honey somebody say God help us all in that preacher too amen the kind of the kind of now listen I've been around this for a while I'm talking about the kind of people that can sit around and tell racist jokes and then come to church and sing Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world. Hey Amen. Let me tell you something. If you're still, you tell a racist junk, I mean, anywhere, and then you want to come into church, and, and uh, look, I'm not talking about anybody here, but I'm just saying in general. I wouldn't want somebody teaching my children 
uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't want them in the children's church teaching about anything because do you love my children or do you not? Uh, because you're being a hypocrite. Because let me tell you what I found in the Bible. All nations were created from one blood. Yes, cultural people have cultural differences, uh, but at day's end, we all bleed red. Uh, and let me tell you, you got a pancreas just like I do. Come on, you got a liver just like I do, a heart just like I do. And let me tell you, uh, the day that you start worrying about another person's pigmentation uh, is the day that you've got messed up salvation. Come on now. Hey Amen. They criticize the drug addict, but they just can't quit watching porn. Drive down Gray Street, bunch of drug addicts, bunch of crackheads. Maybe we need to start coming up with new terms, you porn head. Huh? You porn moron. Huh? I mean, let's get real, somebody. Anybody know what I'm saying? That's being a hypocrite. I'm telling you, if you're going to live it, live it. I'm not condoning anything that is unrighteous. What I'm trying to show you is the contrast of how we come off sometimes. Say amen. I'm talking about the kind of people who criticize the way you parent your children. Huh? You ever met anybody like that? But... Listen, Lucy, I don't mean to break it to you, but your kids didn't turn out too well either. The kind of people that are saying, man, I, I hate a liar. Never mind the fact we ain't supposed to hate anybody, but you know. I hate a liar. But I mean, if, if it's convenient at the right moment in time, uh, you lie too. Is it right? No. All liars are going to have their part in the lake of fire is what the Bible said. But you need to back up, honey. You better start learning to have some compassion. Because one of these days you're going to stand before the God whose eyes are as flame and fire, feet like fine brass, and a garment clothed all the way to the foot. And you're going to have to stand before a God and be measured by the same rule of measurement you measured everybody else. You better have compassion now. Come on and say Amen. I've met people that say, man, I can't stand a thief. I hate a thief. You ever said that? You ever had that attitude? I can't stand a thief. And be the, be the first one, 15 minutes before they're supposed to be at work, punch in and stand there. Or call somebody, punch me in. Or when it's time to clock out, have somebody clock them out an hour after they've already gone. You know what that is? That's stealing. Well, I hate a thief. Yeah, but my boss got insurance and this and that and the other. It ain't going to hurt nothing. You need to take inventory because God says you are naked before me. There ain't nothing that I don't know about you. That's right. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Now, some of you are probably thinking you already have. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's some years ago. I had a preacher who contacted me, and I thought he was contacting to see how I was doing, what's going on. You know what he wanted to tell me? He said, I saw brother so-and-so in your church. Is it, is it, he got a ponytail? That's what he called to tell me. He got the ponytail? Yeah, he got, yeah, he got shoulder-length hair with a rubber band in the back. He had a, he had a, he had a, he had a ponytail. Yeah. It caught me so off guard. Let me tell you why it caught me off guard. He called to ask me, the brother in my church have a ponytail and the same man just a few years prior cheated on his wife with another man. Can somebody say this word with me? Hypocrisy. We better get down off of our soapbox. Oh my God in heaven. You know why? Because God knows. God knows everything. God knows those sins that are so easily con concealed in your lustful mind. He knows those thoughts. You know, other people might not, like I said earlier, maybe they can't smell marijuana. Maybe they, maybe they can't smell that alcohol because you got something else going on that you can conceal. It's dangerous. 
That that you can conceal, those lustful thoughts that you ponder on and the things you allow the enemy to work on you. That's just as wrong as many of the other things you criticize on other people. Huh? Am I right, somebody? We can look up and say, we be the kind of person that can put down six plates down at the buffet and then turn around in the same breath and criticize somebody else because they take anxiety medicine. They on them crazy pills. I got news for the internet. I'm on crazy pills. Y'all still love me? Huh? You gonna fall out with me? Some of y'all worry about crazy pills. Some of y'all diabetic pills, heart pills, every other kind of pills. And you worried about what somebody, well, they on them crazy pills. Yeah, keep on going down to Ryan's, put another plate behind, and keep on being gluttonous and keep on working on that extra shed you're building out front of your condo. Come on, somebody. Because at day's end, sin is still sin no matter how you look at it. What you need to do is pray, God, have mercy on me. Amen. Because you know what? God has the 411 on what's really going on in your life. How can we be so easy and quickly to point out the faults of other people? Now, now that we know that God is aware of every fine detail of our life, how is it we are so quickly and easily able to point out everybody else's faults? Now, in the past, I have likened it to this. I've got children. Anybody got children or grandchildren? I know all of my children's faults. But this is about as ridiculous that I can imagine that it must be for God in heaven to watch his children fight, fuss, bicker, and tear each other down in the kingdom work like a parent with children. Well, you went to bed. Well, you failed last year. You ain't good at math. Well, that's fine. You can't get a girlfriend. That's about how childish that some folks act. I'm just telling you that God sees and God knows it all. So when you start posturing and you start bowing up your chest like you somebody, when you look at her, can't believe she does like that. Well, there's probably some things that God can't believe you do either. You better pray through. You better beg for mercy. You better beg God to help you. Come on now. Some folk, gonna want, they're going to think, well, Pastor Myers, you know, he done went crazy. He's trying to justify sin. No, what, I, what I'm trying to do is that there's some people who are more worried about all kinds of materialistic things than they are about their own soul salvation. They're worried about all kinds of other mess. Amen, somebody. But I have to wonder what God thinks whenever he sees it. But I th- felt like that God gave me this message for two purposes. I told you the first is to address that hypocritical tendency that that many have while that God looks on and aware of every single detail, every snag, spiritual snag nail they got in their life. And then there's one other aspect, and that is God's mercy. But if you'll allow me for just a moment before I move on to that, I want to show you an illustrative point that I have used in the past. Those that have been under my ministry for many years may remember me using this illustration or example, but it's something that God gave me many years ago. And and to this day, it is still relevant and it still comes back to my mind often. Brother Eric, I was watching a a documentary type thing, one time reality thing. And in this deal, they they were showing how that uh, these people were getting convicted of crimes in a particular uh, city or county. And the judge in that county had taken a a zero-tolerance policy. And they started coming up with unique ways to try to deter people from doing the same stuff, committing the same problems. One of the problems that they had in this particular town was prostitution. And so they chose to to make a, a very strange decision, but in a way it was kind of comical. What they would do is whenever a person got picked up for trying to pick up a prostitute, they would make them wear a sandwich board. Anybody know what a sandwich board is? You got a string here and a string here, and on the front you got a board, and on the back you got a board. So, they, so part of their sentence when they sentenced them in court was they had to wear a sandwich board. And on that sandwich board on the front and on the back, it said, I got caught picking up a prostitute off this street. 
And they had to go to the street where they got picked up and walk up and down the street. Somebody say, that's a mess show enough. Huh? That's crazy. But they said that the, they said it started going down. But I told you that because when I saw that, the Spirit of God shifted my focus and showed me something completely different. And I have never really looked at it the same since then. Because the principal idea is that other people can see what we don't want them to see. It's out front where everybody knows. And they were trying to use humiliation to control the bad, the bad uh, tendencies in crime. But, but bear with me for just a moment and let me ask you a question. Suppose or just imagine. Uh, Brother Kuhn, come here for just a minute if you will. Just imagine, I, I told Sister Myers I wanted to get me one of them signs. I couldn't, I, one of them boards. I was going to make one this morning, but I couldn't. Come here. We're going to see what you look like with one of these uh, things on you, okay? We're just going to pretend like this is your sign, okay, front and back. Just imagine he's got strings here and strings over here. And uh, I try real hard not to make you look crazy, okay? You love me like crazy. Amen. But just imagine with me for a moment that Brother Coon came into church this morning and he was wearing one of them sandwich boards. And on the front, right here, number one, it says, I'm here a lot, but I hardly ever pay my tithes. And number two, it said, last night, I was lusting after my neighbor's wife. Number three, I was doing my taxes last week and I cheated the IRS. Number six, my wife asked me if she looked good, and she didn't, and I said yes. Come on. <laughs> so, what I'm telling you is, is there's a list of stuff that he is guilty of. A list on the front and a list on the back. Now, come here, brother, for just a minute. You going to help me out? All right. And so we're going to say this, brother, he got some problems. He got some things going on in his life, some obvious sin. Come on over here, brother Coon. He's going to come up. I want you to point your finger at him. Point your finger at him like you're talking it down to him, like condescending. Point your finger at him. Go ahead. It's all right. Point your finger. Yeah, point your finger. That's all right. He, just, he said, well, I heard about you. He said, where have you been the last four weeks? We ain't seen you. You've been laying out of church of what you've been doing. Let me tell you something. If you could see what God sees do you know how hard it would be and how ridiculous it would be to go up to somebody else and start talking about, oh, I heard about you. Oh, I know all about you. Yeah, because you know what we would do? This brother over here is like, you ain't phasing me none because while you're just stepping over here on my turf, let me, let me point out, oh, what? The, oh, wait. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't come over here pointing out a bunch of junk. Do you know that's about how I feel about some people? Huh? Not too long ago, I had a preacher that got on line right after I posted a picture, something that he wouldn't have agreed with, and made a big deal about people breaking their vows and people, their bad influence and all this kind of stuff. Bless you, brother. Bless you. Because I can still remember the time when you was flexing in the mirror, taking selfies of your big old muscles uh, and posting them on Facebook and everything else. So why are you worried about somebody else? You need to go worry about yourself and I said it because I know things uh, you know the reason why some people do things subliminally and they say stuff about you behind your back because you know all about their 411 and they know don't come on over here talking about my daughter because I can tell everybody about your daughter amen don't you come over here talking about my husband because I can show enough tell you about some things about your husband uh, amen why do we even have to go down that road uh, if we had the compassion of Christ and the mercy of the Lord, if you see somebody that's not where they need to be, buddy, you better pray for them lest you fall into the same snare and the same temptation. Quit hypocriting on God. Quit pointing fingers at other people about mess you're guilty of yourself. Get right with God. Somebody say, God, help him move on this morning. Amen. I'm going to tell you this morning, but God didn't send me just to preach against our hypocrisy. But he also sent me here to preach the reality of how much he knows about us, and yet he still loves us. 
We are naked before God. He knows it all. And yet, He still loves us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Those of you that do not agree with lesbianism, homosexuality, huh? if one of your children told you, Daddy, I'm homosexual, I'm a lesbian, I've done gone the other way, as much as that would break your heart, would you quit loving them? No. As much as that would break your heart, would you want to just give up hope on them? I hope not. Because here's the thing. There are things that people may do that are against God's word. But if we, the church, don't wake up, we're going to push the same people God's trying to heal and get better and get them saved away from the church. Say amen. What we need is the compassion of God that even in the midst of their sin, I don't know about you, but I was living in adultery. I was living in fornication. I was living in thievery and lying and cheating and stealing and every manner of ungodliness. Uh, but somehow or another, the Spirit of God came down in the very graveyard of my problems uh, and let me feel him just enough to know he was wooing me his way. Let me tell you, there are some church folks, uh, they wouldn't come 20 feet from you. They'd rather talk about you behind your back. Uh, brother, if you don't agree with me, pray for me. But at days in, you better start praying for yourself. Amen, amen. I'm going to tell you something this morning. I've got a God and so do you that that his mercy is incredible. What kind of love to know. I have sat down with people before that have just broke down crying and have said to me, there are things that I'm haunted by, Pastor, that come to my mind sometimes that I've done in my past and every time I think about it, I cringe. I, just, I, I think, oh my God in heaven, how could I have ever done that? Let me tell you, you need to allow that very premise to help you when somebody else does wrong or gets on your nerves. It makes it a whole lot easier to have mercy when we realize how messed up God loved us. I don't want a person in this building or online to go away thinking somehow or another I'm justifying ungodliness and unrighteousness. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident of this, that God's pretty sick of the hypocrisy in the church. The same kind of people that have criticized somebody else. I can't believe that guy listened to country music. Don't he know that in our clique, in our church, did he? None of us listen to country music. Shouldn't he have quit doing that by now? All right, brother. Go home and keep watching Medea. Go home. Come on now. Go home and keep watching them programs that your wife's done ask you to cut it off ten times and you just keep on, well, this is a good program. Y'all look at me like you know what I'm talking about. Come on now. Well, they listen to country music and everything. I'm not telling you, I don't listen to country music anymore. It was a, man, I'm telling you, George Strait was my, he was my hero. But I traded George Strait in for Jesus. Huh? I don't listen to him no more. But let me tell you, I don't feel one bit bad about the fact that last night while we were sitting in that quinceanera and one of them songs came on there, you can't touch it. My 1990s toe started. Can't touch this. I can still do the MC Hammer. It might break my backbone, but I can still do the MC Hammer. You know why I don't feel bad about it? Because I'm not planning on going back where I was. Huh? 
And I realize, I'm wise enough to realize that the blood of Jesus Christ is so much higher, brighter, better, prettier, fuller, better than anything else on this planet. Amen. I'm telling you that I put my hope, I put my trust, I put my everything, I put my stock in the blood because if the blood ain't good enough, buddy, I'm in trouble. Instead of me going somewhere looking down my nose, oh, I can't believe. Do you see the way they do? Do you see the way they are? I just say, God, have mercy on my soul. I pray they make it. I pray I make it. And that day's in. I'm going to let you do what you do, God. You judge according to righteous judgment. And that day's in. I'm going to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. Say amen, somebody. And I'll keep on twitching my toe. To you. you can't touch this. Because I didn't sin not one single near time. No, I didn't. I'm telling you, there's a lot of folk better get a hold of what I'm saying. Because the self-righteous, hypocritical spirit has held so many people back. Not too long ago, I don't know why I'm going to share this, but I'm going to say it anyway, unless the Lord tells me to be quiet. I just feel like telling you this. Here not too long ago, God began to deal with me on some things, began to show me some things through the spirit of truth and revelation. And as I began to see those things, I posted a a thing on social media about what is holiness and what is holiness not. It went about as viral as an Apopka preacher's post can be. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people sharing it, liking it. Why? You know what I found out? There's a whole lot more people just like you and me who are sicked up to their eyeballs with hypocrisy, with double standards, with saying one thing out of one side of their mouth and doing something out the other side. I said, Pastor Myers, you sure have changed a lot in just a few weeks. No, baby, let me tell you something. Years of being in ministry and years of seeing garbage and foolishness. Somebody told me the other day, we was talking about that, uh, my wife and I amongst ourselves. Well, there's some people, they won't include you in their clique or their crowd no more. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of those same people. I was never good enough for their crowd to begin with. I'm not trying to run with your crowd. If your crowd's going to heaven, then I want to be a part of it. But let me tell you, all of us that have put our faith in Christ, it will be the blood of Jesus that will get us all to heaven. Not your 1950s creed. Not somebody's 1800s creed. Not somebody's 2021 creed. It will be the creed of the Bible and the way God says it ought to be. Come on and say amen. I probably already said too much. I probably done lost a 1,000 followers, but praise God. Hopefully God will replace it with 4,000 that got some good sense. Stand to your feet, if you will, this morning. I'm going to tell you this morning that the Lord knows that there are things that the enemy can use to cause you to beat on your own chest. Look at me. Look, I do this. I do that. Look at me. I'm so much better. Quit all that. Start focusing on this one thing. We're going into 2024, if God permits, before you know it. And this is what I want you to start doing. I want to go into 2024 with one sole purpose. And you ready for it? I want to win souls. I want us to go into 2024, and I want us to have a made-up mind to win souls. I'm not trying to go into 2024 to get a bunch of people to listen to the same kind of music I listen to, wear the same kind of clothes I wear, to do what I like to do. Man, you might be into Harley Davidson. That ain't my thing. Come on. We love you. We'll treat you right. Let me tell you something. I want to see people saved in 2024. What about you? You know why? Because that's what God wants. And when the church gets interested in what God's interested in, you're going to see God do great things. Say amen, somebody. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano this morning, I want to challenge you as we give this altar call today that you would say, God, help me to purge out hypocritical tendencies, narrow-minded attitudes towards other people. Help me to have the kind of compassion that you have, Lord. Do you know if it were up to some people, the way that they come across They would drive everybody away from the church. 
Let me share with you an example of what I'm talking about. Maybe you've heard me say this before. But I was pastoring a church years ago, and I like to die. I mean, that's a figure of speech, but yeah. I had a lady in my church. Man, she was so abrasive. And she came to me one day after church, and Brother Eric, she said, I went over to my neighbor's house. She said, he went and got him a bunch of tattoos. Bear in mind, the neighbor ain't even saved. He's sitting in his table, at a coffee table at, in his living room, minding his own business, drinking beer. And she come knocking on the door. She said, I went over there and I sat down in that living room and I told him just how wrong them tattoos were and how wrong that alcohol was. I said, you did what? She said, I told him, Pastor. I said, but did you ask him, did he want to serve the Lord? Did he want Christ in his life? Did I kind of tried to say it in a nice way. You know, sometimes, Pastor Myers, I use humor to try to soften the blow. I say, well, sister, you know, we're supposed to be fishers of men. I'm going to tell you exactly what she said to me. Now you're going to know why I like to die. She said, Pastor, I threw away my fishing pole a long time ago. Now I just beat him over the head with it. You know what I started doing shortly after that? God, please, would you move sister so-and-so out of this church? Wouldn't you? Somebody say, God, give us the right spirit. Oh, my God. Would you come to the altar this morning? Come on, let's flood the altar. Let's pray and ask God to help us get rid of our pharisaical, hypocritical, I'm better than you spirit and have compassion on the lost. Let's rise up with a new agenda. One that says, let's see souls saved. Whatever that might look like or cost. I want to see the lost call saved at whatever cost. Come on, God, help me get rid of that attitude. That negative, self-righteous, look at me attitude. Well, I'm not like they are. I go to church more than they do. I pay more tithes than they do. I've been in this longer than they have. I was raised in church. They weren't raised in church. God, help me get rid of some junk. I'm wrong. I've been wrong. But I want to be right. I failed. But I don't want to fail anymore. Please let me look at my family different than I've ever looked at them. Please let me use love when I deal with them. Lord, I want my spirit to be right. I want the spirit to be right because it is your spirit within me. God, remind me. If that's what it takes every time that somebody gets on my nerves, every time somebody does wrong and I'm ready to throw them on the barbecue grill of Christianity, remind me of all the times that I failed and I had to bury my face in the altar and I said, God, I know I shouldn't have said that. I know I shouldn't have done it. Would you forgive me? And help me to return the same mercy and forgiveness to the people who get on my nerves. Help me to pray for those, God, who are not saved. Help me, God, to have the same compassion that you had on me the day that I knelt in an altar and didn't deserve an ounce of salvation, but you gave it to me anyway. For all the years of my life that I was not where I needed to be, but mercy came calling I'm not telling you don't talk to the people who are lost or wayward. I'm not telling you that the people who are wrong not to talk to you. I'm telling you change your approach. Some of you may need to change your approach. Let them feel it. Let them sense it. Let them know it. I love you. And if you don't really love them like you need to, stay in an altar until you do. Stay in an altar until you come up with a different attitude. Pray for other people's kids the same way you would want them to pray for your kids. Have compassion on other people's family like you would want them to have on your family. Show mercy and compassion to that woman's husband the same way you would want somebody to show compassion and mercy to yours. I'm telling you this morning, it's real, it's real, it's real. It's real. The love of God is real. The 
compassion of God is real. His mercy endures forever and ever and ever and ever. I'm naked before you, God. I am fully exposed. You see it all. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. You know all about me. You know all about me. You know everything there is to know about me. You know the private areas of my life. You know the secret thoughts that I never tell anybody about. 